first time I'm giving a talk on this topic. I had done of Peace TV interviews approximately 13 years back in the year 2006, which was the first year of the launch of the Peace TV English. And it ran into 32 episodes of one hour each. We say one hour, but it's approximately 50 minutes. So the complete episode of Ramdan Adit with Dr. Zakir was for more than 26 hours. And now I'm supposed to summarize this in about one hour. I did not do complete justice when I gave all the TV talks, all TV interviews. I will try and at least scratch the surface today because it is, four per, it is less than 4% of what I spoke in the TV interviews. This was the only TV interview that was recorded by Peace TV because I normally don't give TV talks or TV interviews in my own studio. This was the only solo TV interviews which ran into 32 episodes. Before we delve into the topic, let us understand what is the meaning of the word Ramadan. Ramadan comes from the Arabic word Ramida or Ramd, which means intense scorching heat. It's also derived from the Arabic word Ramad, which means sun baked sand. In Islamic terminology, Ramadan means the scorching heat which is there in the stomach due to thirst. The intense heat which is there in the stomach due to, due to thirst and a good Muslim by his good deed he scorches the evil away. Ramadan is the ninth month of the Islamic calendar. And the topic of today's talk is Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakir. Dr. Zakir, there was a short introduction about that. What is the meaning of the word date? Date has several meanings. It's a pun. One of the meaning is an appointment. So today Ramadan, an appointment with Dr. Zakir. One of the meaning of date, it is tamar, it is the fruit. You say khajur, tamar, the fruit. Inshallah, you'll be having that very shortly. The third meaning is iftar. You know, we have tamar and iftar. So today, Ramadan, an appointment, a date, an iftar with Dr. Zakir. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. Volume number one, hadith number eight, that Islam is based on five pillars. The first is testifying that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is Tawheed, that is Shahada, and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, it is Akim Salah, establishing prayer. Number three is giving zakat, obligatory charity. Number four is performing hajj, that is pilgrimage to the city of Makkah in the month of hajj. And fifth is psalm, that is fasting in the month of Ramadan. So fasting in the month of Ramadan is the fifth pillar of Islam. Let me remind you that fasting in the month of Ramadan, the fifth pillar, is the only pillar in Islam which has only few references in the Quran. The Quran mentions about fasting in Ramadan in only four verses. Only four verses. Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 183. Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 184. Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 85. And Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 87. Only four verses in the Quran speak about fasting in the month of Ramadan. Otherwise the other pillars, Tawheed, there are hundreds and thousands of verses in the Quran directly and indirectly talking about about Shahada and Tawheed. There are hundreds of verses talking about Salah only in the Quran. Hundreds of verses talking about Zakat. There are several verses talking about Hajj. But as far as 
the fifth pillar of Islam is concerned, Psalm, fasting in the month of Ramadan, there are only four verses. Surah Bakra, chapter number 2, verse 183, 184, 185, and 187. I started my talk by quoting a verse from the Quran, from Surah Bakra, chapter number 2. Verse number 23, which says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, O you who believe, Qutiba alaykum sayyamu, Fasting has been prescribed to you. Qutiba alaykum sayyam. Kama qutiba alaykum kul. Min kablakum. As it was prescribed to people who come before you, so that you may learn taqwa, self-restraint. La lakum taqilun. Allah has prescribed to you fasting as it was prescribed to people who came before you so that you may learn taqwa. La lakum tattaqoon. So that you may learn taqwa. You may learn self-restraint. You may learn God consciousness. So one of the major reasons that fasting has been prescribed to the believers, to the Muslims, is so that you may acquire taqwa. That is God consciousness. It's piety. It is righteousness. Today the psychologists they tell us that if you can control your hunger, you can control almost all your desires. And we know that every machine, it requires a servicing. Sometimes maybe servicing every month, sometimes every three months, sometimes every six months, sometimes yearly. If you allow me to call the human being a machine, it is the most advanced machine that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. Don't you think we require a servicing? So I say this month of Ramadan, the fasting in the month of Ramadan and the complete month of Ramadan is the annual servicing of the human body and the human soul. It is the annual overhauling where we come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we can control our hunger, we can control almost all your desires. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 184, that is the next verse, that fasting has been prescribed to you for a fixed number of days. But if you are ill or if you are traveling, you can make up the prescribed days later on. And if it's difficult for you, like if you are very old, then you can feed the indigent. And if you feed more, it is better. But the best is to fast. The next verse Allah says in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 95. Ramadan was the month in which the Quran was revealed as a guidance to humankind. As a sign of guidance and criteria to judge right from wrong. Ramadan is a blessed month in which the Quran was revealed. And we know from various hadith that Archangel Gabriel every year during Ramadan used to come and revise what was revealed of the Quran with our beloved Prophet Muhammad whatever was revealed till that time everything was revised and rehearsed by Archangel Gabriel with the Prophet Muhammad and the last year before the demise of our beloved Prophet Muhammad in the last Ramadan Archangel Gabriel, he rehearsed it twice in order because when the Quran was revealed, it was revealed in a different order. But what we have today is the order that was ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was revised by Archangel Gabriel every Ramadan and the last Ramadan twice with the beloved Prophet. And the verse continues, Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse 85, that those who are at home, they should fast in the month of Ramadan and those who are traveling or ill they may make up for the number of prescribed days later on and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he wants facilities for you and he does not want to put hardship on you therefore make up the number of days and you glorify him the fourth verse of the Quran talking about fasting of Ramadan is in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 2, 187, which says, 
that permitted for you during the nights of fast is approaching your wives hunna libasul lakum wa antum libasul lahunna they are your garments and you are the garments allah says the wives are the garments of the husbands and the husbands are the garments of the wife the role of the garment is to protect and beautify one another the role of the husband and wife in islam is to protect and beautify one another and to support one another and the verse of the quran continues that you have to fast during the month of ramadan and after allah says hunna libasul lakum antum libasul lahunna allah continues and says we know we are aware that you used to secretly associate with your wife but allah has turned to you and has forgiven you now you can approach and associate with your wife and eat and drink till the white thread of dawn is differentiated from the black thread of dawn and continue fasting till the start of night but when you are in etikaf retreat in the mosque do not approach your wife these are the rules laid down by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these four verses of the quran are the only verses which talk about fasting in ramadan there are other verses of fasting in the quran which are not related to ramadan but other fasting like kafara if you are not able to slaughter during hajj etc these are seven verses in the quran it's mentioned the quran in seven verses allah mentioned the fast not related to ramadan in surah baqara chapter number 2 verse number 196 It's mentioned in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number ninety-two. In Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number eighty-nine. In Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number ninety-five. In Surah Maryam, chapter number nineteen, verse number twenty-six. It's mentioned also in Surah Azab, chapter thirty-three, verse number thirty-five, and in Surah Mujadilah, chapter number fifty-eight, verse number three and four. These are the seven verses where fasting are mentioned, which are not related to Ramadan. Time will not permit us to go into detail. But my point to be noted is that the majority of the ruling of fasting in Ramadan is given in the Hadith. Only four verses in the Quran. That is the reason in my thirty-two episodes, I quoted hundreds of Hadith, and only four direct verses of the Quran related with with fasting. time will not permit me to cover everything we have limited time i will at least mention a few points i will give references of only few hadith to save time otherwise we will not be able to scratch the surface also i'll quote the important hadith related with fasting along with references and the remaining only the matter our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it is mentioned in the hadith of tirmidhi volume number 3 hadith number 1423 that for three types of people the pen allah has lifted for a person who sleeping until he wakes up for a person for a person who is a boy until he becomes an adult and a person who is insane until he becomes sane based on this hadith and the four verses of the quran we come to know for whom is it obligatory to fast whom it is obligatory to fast number 1 there are some criteria for whom it makes a man obligatory to fast number 1 he should be a muslim number 2 he should be an adult number 3 he should be sane number 4 he should be healthy and number 5 he should be settled and should not be traveling if all these five conditions are fulfilled it becomes obligatory it becomes obligatory for a muslim man to fast for a woman there are additional four criteria besides these five for a woman besides she being an adult she being a muslima she being a muslima number 1 she being an adult she being sane she being healthy being in a place where she settled and not traveling she should not be menstruating 
She should not have postnatal bleeding. She should not be breastfeeding and she should not be pregnant. So if these nine criteria are fulfilled, it becomes obligatory for a Muslim man or woman to fast. As far as exemption, the categories which are exempted for fasting, there are three categories. Those which do not have to compensate for the fast they have missed. There are three types. A Muslim, a person who is a minor, and a person who is insane. The second category, those who have to compensate for the fast they have missed when the condition is reversed. There are eight categories in this. Number one, that's the menstruating woman. A woman who is undergoing postnatal bleeding. A woman who is pregnant. A woman who is breastfeeding. And a person who is ill, a person who is traveling, a person who has gone for jihad, for a battlefield in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a person under compulsion. If somebody puts a gun on your forehead and says, eat, like we know some of our Muslim brothers in China, they are forced under compulsion to eat during Ramzan, so then it's permitted and they can fast later on. The last category is, that is, they have to feed a poor person because they could not fast. There are two types of people in this. Number one, a person who is terminally ill or disabled, or a person who is a very old man, who cannot compensate later on. So for these two categories, he has to feed one indigent person for one fast he has missed. If you miss the full Ramadan, then 30 people he has to feed. So this was in short about the categories of those who are exempted from fasting. As far as acts that invalidate fasting, we know some of it, but most of us don't know the details. It can be categorized into two types. Acts in which something is taken into the body, and act in which something is discharged from the body. In the first category, there are four types of things. The first category, acts in which you take something into the body. Number one is eating and drinking. Number two, anything which is similar to eating or drinking. Number three, medicine, pills, injection, which are in the form of nourishment, which are taken into the body, including blood transfusion. Number four, kidney dialysis or something similar, where the blood is taken out, it is purified, supplemented and put back into the body. Put back into the body. All these four things in the first category, it invalidates the fast. In the second category, where something is discharged out of the body and the fast is invalidated. Number one is sexual intercourse. Number two is masturbation. Number three, it is the menstruation. Number four is postnatal bleeding. Number five is deliberate vomiting. And number six is letting out blood or cupping or something similar. So these are, in short, the ten things which invalidate the fast. A beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in the Sahih Hadith, in Sunan Tirmidhi, volume number 3, Hadith number 2106, a beloved Prophet said, that when Ramadan begins, the gates of heaven are open, the gates of Jannah, paradise are open, and the gates of hell are closed, and the devils, the Satan, they are chained. And this hadith, you know, we have heard it several times. And when I was a kid also, I heard it. And that time I used to think, and I'm sure you might have also thought, that if the Satans are chained, if the devils are chained, then how come people do sin in the month of Ramadan? We see people robbing, we see people doing zina, we, pe we see people doing crime in the month of Ramadan. Have you ever thought that if the devils are chained, then how come yet people sin? Have you thought this before or not? Who has thought before? Who has thought of this before? Eight, ten people. Who has thought of this before? Oh, mashallah, more people. Do you have the answer? Who has the answer? 
Yes, we do agree, all of us, that during Ramadan, the sin throughout the world decreases. There has been a survey on that. That's without doubt. But it is not zero. I'd like to give you an example for a better understanding. When a tiger or a lion, when the lion or a tiger is chained, are you safe from that lion or not? Yes or no? Yes, we are safe. But there is a criteria. As long as you do not come very close to the tiger. If the tiger is chained with a 10 meter chain, you, you should stay at least 15 meters away. If you come closer than 15 meters to that tiger, then you can get attacked, you can get killed. Right or wrong? As long as you are far away, longer than the distance of the chain, a few meters because the tiger itself is about you know, three, four meters long. So if the chain is 10 meters long, you have to stay at least 50 meters away, then you're safe. The tiger cannot harm you. Similarly, according to my understanding, my logic, I'm a dai, I read the Quran, I read the Hadith, give an answer which is not against any other Hadith, and then ask with the scholars and, and they agree. So similarly, as long as you do not do a very major sin, coming close to the devil or the Satan, if you come close to the Satan, even if he's chained, he will cause you to commit a sin because the Satan and the devils have not been killed. They are chained. So according to my understanding, as long as you stay away from the major sin, generally, Quran says, Ya yu ladina amanu, O you believe, stay away from the footsteps of the devil, the khutwa to shaitan. Now let me give you an example of Futuwa to Shaitan. For example, if a lady who's not your close relative, who's a Naam Haram, she speaks to you on the phone. So you will say, oh, speaking to a lady who's a Naam Haram on the phone, no problem. What is the problem? So you speak once, twice, thrice. Then she says, why don't we have coffee together outside in a cafe, maybe McDonald's. And you say, having coffee with a Naam Aram girl, what's the problem? No problem. So you have coffee with her. You have a couple of time. Then she says, let's have dinner together in a restaurant. So then you have dinner together in a restaurant. Then she says, let's spend the night together. Then you spend the night together. So this is an example of Khutwa to Shaitan. It starts with a phone call. No problem. Having coffee together, no problem. Having dinner together, no problem. Sleeping together, no problem. Khutwa to Shaitan. Now, in Ramadan, the devils are chained. But in Ramadan, if you go to a red light area, you're coming too close to the devil. The chances of you doing zina is high. So my understanding is that in Ramadan you are safe, but don't do major sin. Don't come close to the devil and inshallah you'll be safe. Inshallah. This is the best and highest level of taqwa and iman during the month of Ramadan. Our beloved Prophet said in the Hadith that the gates of Jannah, paradise are open and the gates of hell are closed. Then somebody asked me the question that if the non-Muslims die during Ramadan, where will they go? Where will they go? I can't hear. Where will they go? Sorry? Hell, but the gates of hell are closed. A prophet said that, and a prophet cannot lie, knows Billah. How do you explain this hadith? When the gates of Jannah are open and the gates of hell are closed, and if a non Muslim dies, what will happen? So I thought for a while, and then I got the answer with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the hadith says that the gates of Jannah are open, that means okay, entry is free, but at least you have to enter. Correct? If you don't make the effort of taking a step into the gate, how will you go to Jannah? For example, you say, I will not offer Salah. A beloved Prophet said in Sahih Muslim, volume number one book of Salah, the difference between Kufr and Iman is Salah. So if you don't offer Salah, the gate is open, entry is free, but you're doing such a big sin. It is the fourth major sin according to Imam al-Dhabi. Then how will you enter Jannah? The gates are closed, 
but some people are doing such big sins that they want to jump over the gate and go. If you do shirk, that means the gates of hell are closed. What are you doing? You are jumping over the gates and going into hell. So if you do shirk, which is the greatest sin in Islam, what are you doing? You are jumping over the gates of hell. Anyway, this is just for understanding. It's not mentioned in the Quran, it's not mentioned in the Hadith. The human mind actually, it can only understand what it knows. So a person who is a kafir, he is doing shirk. He is going out of the way and jumping over the gates of hell to enter into it. Then who's to blame? The person who is doing the sin. So this was just three analogy I have given you to understand the hadith. And this is a very important hadith. There are some other important hadith which I will quote with reference because of time limitations. Otherwise, as I mentioned, there are hundreds of hadith talking about Ramadan and fasting. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, hadith number 1901, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, that anyone who fasts in the month of Ramadan, the complete month of Ramadan, with sincerity and seeking the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah forgives all his past sins. So easy. Allah is so generous. This is the month of forgiveness. If you fast the full month of Ramadan, 29 or 30 fast, with sincerity and seeking the reward from Allah, Allah will forgive all your past sin. It's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number one. Hadith number 552, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said that the five times of prayers from one Juma to the other Juma, from one Ramzan to the next Ramzan, it is expiation of your sins you have done in between, as long as you stay away from major sins. This Hadith says the five times that you pray, the one Juma that you offer till the next Juma, the one Ramzan that you fast to the next Ramzan. All the sins you do in between, Allah will forgive. But there is a criteria, as long as you stay away from the major sins. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, Volume number 3, Hadith number 1903, our beloved Prophet said that if a person cannot give up his false speech and evil actions, Allah does not require him to give up his food and drink. This hadith means that if you fast and you have false speech, doing gibat, backbiting, abusing, and doing false actions, all the wrong evil action, then Allah does not require you to fast. It is useless. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three. Hadith number 1904, a beloved Prophet Muhammad said that fasting, it prevents you, prevents you from entering the hellfire and prevents you from sinning. It's mentioned in Sunan Ibn Majah, volume number 6, Hadith number 6626, that fasting and Quran will intercede you on the day of judgment. Fasting will say, O oh, our Lord, this person fasted and stayed away from food and drink and desires during the day. So I want to intercede on his behalf. Can the people not talk over there please? I would request the crew I request the crew over there that please if they can keep silent. Jazakallah. I think somebody else is there talking. Can the crew please? It will be appreciated if you can keep quiet please. Jazakallah shukran. The Quran will say, O oh, our Lord, this person he stayed away from sleeping at night. I will intercede on his behalf. And Allah will permit them to intercede. So fasting will intercede on the day of judgment. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 3, hadith number 1904. 
that our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that all the actions done by the son of man is for himself alone. All the action done by Adam's son is only for himself except fasting is for me alone. All the action that you do, all the other ibadah that you do is only for yourself. That's what Allah is saying. A prophet is saying, Allah is saying. It's a hadith qudsi A prophet is saying, Allah says that all the action done by the son of Adam is for himself alone except for fasting. And I will reward him. Fasting will prevent you from hellfire and from sin. And I will give him a reward for his action. And if he abstains from having sex with his wife or quarreling, and if he gets angry, someone instigates him, he should not get angry. He should say, I am fasting, I am fasting. So this hadith tells us, all the other ibadah, you know, a person can pray only to show to the people. And you know, I am praying, you know, as Allah says in Surah Maun, they pray only to be seen of men. Someone may give charity to show off, zakat. It can be he's doing for himself, not for Allah. But fasting, no. For well, fasting, you don't have to show. You can go inside a closed room and eat. Who will come to know? Except Allah. So fasting, if you are really fasting, it is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. And what is the difference between fasting and starvation? Scientific research tells us that if you fast, abstain from eating food within 12 hours, up to 24 hours, what happens? Your carbohydrate source, it is utilized as a source of energy. The carbohydrate that you have in the body is utilized as a source of energy. But if you abstain from eating food more than 24 hours, it's called a starvation. Your protein is used as a source of energy. Fasting is healthy for the body. Starvation is unhealthy for the body. And fasting is actually 12 hours plus minus few hours. So scientific research says that fasting is beneficial for the body. Inshallah, if time permits, we will give more points about that later on. When we do suhoor, the Arabic word suhoor is derived from the Arabic word sahar, which means the latter part. Sahur is the meal you have just before the break of dawn, before Fajr. And suhoor is the act of taking sahur. The word iftar comes from the Arabic word fatar, which means to break, which means to tear, which means cleave asunder. So fatur is the meal taking for breaking the fast. And iftar is the act of taking the meal. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, as mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, word number three, hadith number 1957, that my people will be on the straight path till they hasten in breaking the fast. That means once the time of fasting is over, the moment sun sets, you should break the fast immediately. There are some people for precaution, they said we'll break the fast three minutes late, we'll break the fast five minutes late for precaution. Our beloved Prophet said, my people will be on the straight path, it's Hadith of Bukhari. Till the time they hasten in breaking the fast. The moment time is up, you should have it immediately. You know, previously maybe there was difference of opinion. Now, in the age of science and technology, where is the difference of opinion? Maybe about 20, 30 years back, there were watches, but you know, depending upon the watch, if you have a cheap watch, every day there's a difference of one second, in a month there'll be 30 seconds. If you have an average watch, difference is five seconds in a month. If you have a good watch like Rolex, maybe two, three seconds in a month. This is how accurate, the more expensive watch, accurate. The most accurate watch is the watch on the Makkah clock tower in the world. I've been there several times. The watch 
on the clock tower of Makkah, just close to the Haram. It is the most accurate clock in the world. Difference of, I think, one nanosecond. I mean, 0.00, I don't know, 9 or 12 zeros. Point less than one nanosecond in a year. But today, it's very easy. If you have even your mobile, which is a cheap mobile, costing 500 ringgit also, cheap. If you keep it on the auto mode, it gets linked to the satellite. It will never go wrong. Every day it's corrected. If you have a very good mobile, if you keep it auto mode, even my iPhone, if I keep auto mode, within a few days there will be a difference of a few seconds. One month there will be a five seconds. But if you keep on the auto mode, on the Wi-Fi, it gets corrected every, every day. Many times in a day it gets corrected. So you cannot go wrong. So if you have your mobile connected on the auto mode, there's no question of you going wrong. So you should hasten, and the other hadith says, you should have your suhoor as late as possible and have the iftar as early as possible. And normally during iftar, there are various duas people recite. But there is no dua for breaking the fast, except saying bismillah when you start. There's the dua means after you break the fast. It means sunnah number daud, wife number three, hadith number 2357 that after you break the fast, after you have water, then you say this dua, Zaba Zama. Zaba Zama'u Wapta Lati Uruku Wathabat Al-Ajr Inshallah. That means my thirst is gone away. My veins have been quenched. And the reward is assured if Allah wills. That means this dua, your thirst type means quench, can only be said after you have water. You can't say it before. Some people say before. There are other Zaif hadith is talking about dua. That say is, after you break the fast, eat the date, have the water, then say this dua. That your thirst has gone away, your veins have been quenched, the reward is assured, inshallah. There are certain acts that are permissible while a person is fasting, which many people may think that, not all, some of them may think it is not permitted. Due to due shortage of time, I'll not go into the details, I'll just enumerate the acts that are permissible while fasting. Number one, the biggest misconception, some people think you cannot swallow the spit which is normally secreted. So the acts permissible is you can swallow the spit which is normally secreted. You cannot accumulate it purposely and then have that's wrong. Number two, you can gargle your mouth with water, put water, but be careful that the water should not enter the throat. Number three, you can put water into the nostrils, but don't sniff excessively, it should not go into your throat. Number four, you can use your sevak, it's permitted. You can use toothpaste while brushing your teeth during fasting, it's permitted, but you should not swallow the toothpaste. You, should have, you can have a bath. Unintentional vomiting is permitted. Intentionally is prohibited. You can take injections which do not contain nourishment. You you can take tablets which are sublingual. Many people may not be aware, I'm a medical doctor. If you have angina, you take sublingual tablets, you put the tablet below your tongue. That time, you don't follow it. Through the cutaneous from the mouth, it goes into and the action is done. So you're not breaking your fast. As long as you don't follow the tablet, you're taking a sublingual tablet, keeping below your tongue, it gets absorbed, the medication is done, you don't follow the tablet, that is permissible. You can put no nasal drop or ear drops permissible as long as it does not enter the throat. You can put eyeliner in the eye permitted. You can wear perfume, it is permitted. You can have a bath, it's permitted. You can do per vaginal examination, it's allowed. 
You can put any instrument into the body or any scope for doing investigation is permitted. You can take out blood from your body to test the blood, it's permitted. You can put lotion and skins, or lotion or cream on your skin, it is permitted. You can kiss or embrace your wife as long as you don't go into the prohibited act, that's permissible. You can have a wet dream, that's permissible. You, in the nights of fasting, you can approach having intercourse with your wife, it's permitted. You can be in the state of Janaba, sermonial impurity, it's permitted. For example, at night you may have a wet dream or you had a relationship with your wife and you get up and the time for fasting has started, it's permitted. Your fasting is valid as long as you have a bath as soon as possible. So these are the few important misconceptions that were there in the minds of the Muslims. All these acts that I mentioned, these 20 acts, they are permissible. Let us try and find out what are the objectives of fasting. As far as the objective of fasting is concerned, number one is seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As I mentioned in the Hadith of Sahih Bukhari, poem number three, Hadith number 1904, that the only act done by the son of Adam for Allah is fasting. So we do it for seeking the pleasure of Allah. Number two, to acquire taqwa. La lakum tattaqoon. To acquire taqwa, God consciousness, piety. Number three is to enter Jannah. There are eight gates of heaven. Those who fast will enter through the gate of Rayyan. Number four, for getting reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number five, for expiation of sins, which I mentioned in the hadith earlier. Sahih Bukhari, volume three, hadith number 1903. It is for seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is for interceding on the day of judgment. Objective of fasting. For knowing the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For increasing your determination and your willpower. For increasing your good deeds. For increasing your honesty. For increasing your self-control. All these are objectives of fasting. And to prevent you from going to the hellfire. To narrow the path to constrict the part of the Satan, to abstain from false speech, to abstain from false action. These are the 16 objectives of fasting. So we had the 20 acts permitted in fasting. We have the 16 objectives for fasting. Let's discuss the medical benefits of fasting. I told you the definition of fasting as compared to starvation. Let us discuss the medical benefits of fasting. Number one, it is healthy weight reduction. Most of the weight reduction that you have in the society is unhealthy. But fasting is a healthy weight reduction. It gives rest to the digestive system of your body. Number two. Number three, it reduces the sugar level and stabilizes the insulin in your body. Number four, it reduces the LDL cholesterol, low density level cholesterol. We call it as a bad cholesterol, it reduces it. Number five, it, it boosts the immunity of the body. Number six, it boosts the growth hormone so that the aging process is lowered and the longevity of the, of the life increases. Number seven, it increases the detoxification. Number eight, it increases the resistance towards the oxidation stress. Number nine, it reduces the high blood pressure. Number 10, it reduces the inflammation. Number 11, it protects the brain and improves the brain function. For each scientific fact, we can give a small talk of a few minutes. Time will not permit. So only scientific benefit of fasting will take a few hours if you go into detail. Number 11, it stabilizes the heart rate and it calms the heart. 
Number 12, it increases the production of T cells. Number 14, it increases the breakdown of fat and reduces the triglycerides. Number 16, it reduces the chances of having kidney stones. Number 16, it reduces the pressure on the liver. Number 17, it reduces the secretion of the glands that causes ulcers normally. Number 18, it prevents the Alzheimer's disease. Number 19, it helps in the cure of asthma. Number 20, it helps in the cure of disease such as cardiovascular disease. And it helps in the cure of pancreatitis. It helps in the prevention of cancer. It helps in the cure of addiction. It helps in the cure of alcoholic. If you can abstain from having alcohol from dawn to sunset, you can abstain from having alcohol from the cradle to the grave. It helps in the cure of a chain smoker. If you can abstain from smoking from dawn to sunset, you can abstain from the cradle to the grave. It helps in regeneration of your body. It helps in various skin disorders. These were the 28 medical benefits of fasting. Due to lack of time, I'll just cover one more topic. Though as I told you, there are several topics to be covered. I will just mention the important acts that have to be done by a Muslim in the month of Ramadan. There are very other, other topics like zakat, etikaf, layratul qad, etc. I'll just throw some more light on the topic of the important acts to be done by a Muslim in the month of Ramadan. Number one is, is praying five times compulsory congregation salah in mosque. Note my words, five times compulsory salah in congregation in mosque. See get here. People think only five times Salah is Fard. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that people do not come for Salah in Fajr and in Isha. I feel like asking someone to lead the Salah and go to their homes and burn their home. Hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Very There are several Hadith. Sahih Hadith. The Prophet said those who do not come for Salah in the mosque I feel like going and burning their homes. Based on this, almost all the scholars, except for a limited few, say it is fard to offer compulsory congregation salah five times in the mosque. Except for the Hanafi school of thought, where they say it's a very important high level of sunnah. Close to fard, but not fard. All the other four aimma, the Imam Shafi, Ahmad Ibn Hanbal, Imam Malik, all three of them says praying in the mosque five times in congregation is fard. Some scholar like Imam al dhabi and other scholars like Ibn Qayyum, they say that if you do not pray compulsory five times Salah in the mosque, it's ghunaya kabira. It's not only a sin, it's a major sin. And Imam al dhabi in his book of Kabair places at number 65. If you do not pray five times compulsory salah in a mosque in congregation, Imam al dhabi places in the 70 major sin, he gives it number 65 major sin. And Ibn Qayyum also says that it's a major sin. But almost all agree it's a fard. Some scholars say if you don't do, it's a major sin. So, number one, every day you have to do, but at least in Ramadan, when the devils are chained, that time you offer five times salah. This is for the men, of course, not for the women. That they have to offer five times compulsory salah in the congregation, congregation in the mosque. Number two, fast all the days of Ramadan. 
नंबर थ्री पे जकत इफ यू हैव टू पे इफ इट डी ऑन यू नंबर फोर एक्सटेंड फ्रॉम ऑल हराम नंबर फाइव ऑफर द सलाह द मौकेदा सलाह मौकेदा सलाह मीन्स द स्ट्रेस्ट सुनना सुनत मौकेदा मीन्स दो विच आर हाईली रिकमेंडेड सुनना सलाह and a prophet said if you pray 12 rak'ah sunnah salah you will be like this to me on the day of judgment as close to this two fingers on the day of judgment and these 12 rak'ahs we know the two rak'ah sunnah salah of the fajr before the fajr salah the 2 plus 2 sunnah salah four sunnah salah before the zuhr salah two rak'ah after the zuhr salah and two rak'ah after the maghrib salah and two rak'ah after the isha salah these 12 are sunnat e muqadda and let me give you an example you know there was a uh, you know the whatsapp which says the 10 richest men in the world and it went on saying you know number 8 was ambani it was a few years back and number 3 it was warren buffett number 2 it was bill gates number 1 who's number 1 a muslim who offers two rak'ah sunnah before the fajr salah why because our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the two rak'ah sunnah salah before the fajr is more valuable than the earth and the wealth in it bill gates 100 million dollars jeff because now 160 million after divorce came down to maybe 120 million the world a prophet said if you offer two rak'ah sunnah salah not the farz salah Two rak'ah sunnah salah before the fajr is more valuable than the earth and the wealth in it. If we really trust Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and if we follow it, we are the richest people in the world. But how many of us have faith in Allah? That's a separate question. So number five was sunnat al-muqaddas salah. Number six, that you eat your sahur. Number seven, have sahur as late as possible, just before the adhan. Number nine, that have the futur as early as possible, immediately after sunset. In futur, have dates and have water. That is the sunnah. The dua that a fasting man does. A fasting person does accept it, and if you do dua just before the iftar, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala accepts that dua. While iftar, you read the authentic dua after opening the iftar. Feed the people during iftar, especially the poor people. That's number twelve. Feed the people. If you feed the person who's fasting, you get sawab. Especially the poor people. Pray, pray the taravi. That number thirteen. That's eight rakat. Some say twenty. No problem. That's another topic. Pray the salat to duha, preferably four rakat. Give charity, excessive as much as possible. Besides your fard, fard zakat. Read as much of the sunnah dua as much as possible. When you're going to the toilet, there's a dua. Coming out of the toilet, there's a dua. Going out of the house, there's a dua. Entering the mosque, there's a dua. Coming out of the mosque, there's a dua. Wearing clothes, there's a dua. As much as possible, do as much as zikr as possible during the days of Ramadan. Read as much of Quran with translation if you don't understand Arabic. Do as much of good deeds as possible. Do not get angry. When someone provokes, when someone provokes you, say, "I'm fasting, I'm fasting." Do etikaf the last ten days and nights. Search for the Lailatul Qadar during the last ten nights. Do qiyamul lail besides the tarawi, qiyamul lail in the last ten nights. Do taskeh nafs. That's point number twenty-five. Point number twenty-six. Do as much as Sunnah as possible. What you know of the Prophet, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Read as much as authentic Hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Use the Sawaq, that is the Miswaq. 
abstain from things which are makru. If possible, do umrah in the month of Ramadan. A beloved prophet said, if you do umrah in the month of Ramadan, it, you get the sawab of hajj. Do as many good deeds as possible. Forgive other people's fault. Do as much of islah with the Muslims as possible. Do dawah with the non-Muslims in the month of Ramadan. Read the sunnah gayr maqidah. That is the recommended sunnah, but the less recommended, less stressed. And there are eight rakats. That two plus two, four rakat before the Asr Salah, two rakat before the Maghrib Salah, and two rakat before the Isha Salah. Do as much of supplication and dua as much as possible. Read the Seerah of the Prophet. Hear the lectures of authentic Islamic scholars. Attend them. See various Islamic programs or scholars so your knowledge increases. Give time to your family. Do not waste a single minute. Be cheerful and happy. And see to it that you spread the cheerfulness and happiness around you. These are the 42 important acts that I recommend during the month of Ramadan and inshallah it will get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have cut short my speech to approximately 50 minutes so that we have more time for question answer session. We started a bit late due to technical errors. We actually had one hour for the talk and one hour for the question answer session. I gave 50 minutes talk so that we at least have half an hour, 40 minutes for the question answer session. So if anyone has any questions, I know there will be many, any questions on the topic Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakir, you're most welcome to ask. Please keep the question brief. It should be in two or three sentences. If the question is more than two or three sentences, it becomes a short speech. Please mention your name and your profession so that I will be in a better position to reply. And inshallah, we'll have about half an hour to 40 minutes of question or session. Wakhir dawan alhamdulillah. 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 Thank you, Honorable Dr. Sakir, for the insightful talk. Uh, as we know, we shall now open the floor for Q&A. One person, one question, please. Due to time constraint, just a few words and post a question. So please state your name and your profession. And now we shall begin. Open the floor for any Q&A. There's one. Yes, you can use the microphone. On the floor, there's four microphones. Shall we have the first? All right, we have the first here. Okay, then, okay, we have the first over there. Your name and your profession, sir? Number then. Assalamualaikum Dr. Zakir. My name is Irfan. I work in IT. Um, my question is actually that a lot of us, we grow up with non-Muslim friends, but we actually have never spoken to them about religion. What is your advice for us on this, especially regarding to Ramadan? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zakir. No, that's a question that most of the Muslims have non-Muslim friends. But we do not do dawah to them, do not convey the message. So my advice on that issue, especially in the month of Ramadan. And as I mentioned, that among the 42 important points, one of the important points in the month of Ramadan is convey the message of Islam to your non-Muslim. And why? It is one of the criteria to go to Jannah. If you read Surah Al-Asr, that is chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wal-Asr, innal insana lafi khusr. By the token of time, man is verily in a state of loss. Man is in khasara. Unless he has four criteria. Unless he has iman. He amal salihat. He has righteous deed. Inviting people to the truth. That is doing dawah. And inviting people to patience and perseverance. So these are the minimum four criteria 
according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Asr, for any human being to go to Jannah. If any one of these four criteria are missing, under normal circumstances, according to Surah Al-Asr, you shall not go to Jannah. You may be a very, very good practicing Muslim. You may be fasting in the month of Ramadan. You may be praying five times Salah. You may have gone for Hajj. You may be giving Zakat. But if you don't do Dawah, according to Surah Al-Asr, you shall not go to Jannah. If Allah wants to forgive you and put you in Jannah, that is Allah's prerogative. As Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 48 and in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 116, if Allah wishes, he may forgive any sin, but the sin of shirk, he'll not forgive. So if Allah wants to forgive and put you in Jannah, that he can do, but according to Surah Al-Asr, all four things are equally important. Iman, righteous deed, doing dawa, and inviting people to, pers to patience and perseverance. According to Imam Shafi, Rahimullah, may Allah have mercy on him, he said that if this Surah Al-Asr alone would have been revealed to humanity, it would have been sufficient for the hidayah, for the guidance of humankind. Imagine. I mean, this Surah Al-Asr is so powerful. And Imam Shafi, may Allah have mercy on him. He said it was sufficient for the salvation of humanity, for the guidance of humanity. Why? Because if you refer to all the verses of the Quran, all the verses, 6,236 verses of the Quran, they will fall in one of these four criteria. Either talking about Iman, talking about righteous deed, talking about Dawa or Islah, or talking about patience and perseverance. What happens normally, we Muslims, we feel shy. Or we feel afraid. You know, when we, if we do dawah to a non-Muslim friend, he, we will lose this friendship. This is what you think. Actually, if you talk to your non-Muslim friend with haq, majority of them will get closer to you. We think, if I do dawah, I will lose this friendship. We are more bothered about the friendship of our friend than following Allah subhanahu than following the friendship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 24. in kana abaukum. Say whether it be your fathers. Wa abnaukum. Or your sons. Wa ikhwanukum. Or your brothers. Wa azwajukum. Or your spouses, your wives or husband. Or it may be your relatives. Wa shiratukum. It may be relatives. Allah says, what are your desires? What do you care for? Is it your father? Is it your son? Is it your brothers? Is it your wife? Is it relatives? And Allah continues. What do you love? And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 24, Wa amwalo niqtaraf tumuha, wa tijaratun takshawna kasadaha, wa masakinu tarzonaha. The wealthy have amassed, the business in which you deal, the house in which you live. All these eight things, if you love, Allah continues, that if you love more than Allah, and is Rasul. Allah says in the Quran, min Allahi wa Rasulihi wa jihadin fi sabilihi. If you love all these eight things more than Allah, His Rasul, and doing jihad, striving and struggling, doing dawah in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says, Fatarabbasu, wait. Hatta yati Allahi bi amri. Wait until Allah brings about His decision unto you, until Allah brings about His destruction unto you. And Allah continues and says, Wallahu la adhukum fasakin. And Allah guides not the fasik people. It is compulsory fard for every Muslim that he should do dawah. And there are several verses in the Quran. We get scared that if we do dawah, we will lose our friendship. You know, when I was in the medical college in Bombay, Muslims were hardly 3-4%, very few. And when I used to do dawah with my colleagues and with my professors, when I do dawah, my Muslim friend would run away. Now Zakir will, you know, will make us get a thrashing. And my friends used to say, if you do dawah to the professor, you know, they'll fail you. So I used to tell them, if the professor fails me, I'll do one more your dawah with him. So you have to be optimistic, not pessimistic. And Alhamdulillah, today, the non-Muslims respect me so much. It is now, lately, that the Indian government, for the World Bank, they think, let's, you know, attack the most popular dai so that you get the World Bank. They are not doing, see actually the people, those who are terrorists in the country, what is the BGP government doing? They are giving them seat to fight the election. Because they want to have a fierce psychosis among the Muslims. 
that the person who has killed the Muslims, we will give him a ticket so that he wins and the Muslim will be subjugated. And the person who is doing dawah, they want to terrorize him. They want to show that if we can stop a person who is a da'i, then the other Muslims will get scared. We have to have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how to do dawah? There's a dawah training program. You can go on the net or go to Peace TV. There are various ways how you initiate dawah. You know, that will require days. You know, because one is having knowledge, one is how to initiate. Having knowledge is one thing, initiating is another technique. You can't tell a person that, you know, suppose you're going in a bus and the person next to you is a non-Muslim. You cannot say, oh, Mr. John, you know, since we have 20 minutes, you know, I want to talk to you about Islam. Will he give you time? No. If you just ask him a simple question, brother, what is the cross you are wearing? At the back of your mind, you want to talk about Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Simple question. If you are a Hindu wearing a tikka, ask him what is the tikka you are wearing. You cannot tell him give me time. And when you are sitting in the college or university, you know, you, how to do dawah? You make a simple statement that you know, that if some men in the world are not permitted to have more than one wife, women cannot live peacefully in the world. Ah, talking about polygamy. Okay. Okay. They say, what do you mean by that? Do you have 10 minutes? 10 minutes, I have 20 minutes, explain. So now he thinks he will attack me on the issue of polygamy. I have the answer. I'm asking him for 10 minutes, he wants to give me 20 minutes. Now when he's asking the question, he's paying attention. So there's a technique of how to initiate dawah. Then the answer is there with you. For answers, you can refer to my videos, YouTube. If you go to a YouTube channel, there are hundreds of videos. You go to the Peace TV, it's in four languages. Peace TV, English, Urdu, Bangla, Chinese, Mandarin. And you'll get a lot of information out of Dawa. Hope that answers the question, brother. Inshallah. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. All right. Next question, please. All right. On that corner, please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Zaki Naik. Um, my name is Mama Aizuddin bin Muhammad Razi. Currently, I'm working as a, in financial services. So my question is, do you think that the current so-called Islam my question is, uh, do you think that the current so-called Islamic banking are purely ribak free? Whereas in Islam, if you borrow 1,000 ringgit, you only have to pay back 1,000 ringgit, right? So please, uh, as uh, my question, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brother, ask the question. Before I answer the question, there are total four microphones kept if asking question. One on my right, one in front of me, one here on my left and one behind. All who like to ask a question can please queue uh, behind the microphones so that we save time between the questions. We have limited time. So all who like, who'd like to ask a question, please make a queue behind the microphones. The brother asked the question that, do I agree with Islamic banking that is it, is it riba free, is it interest free? Because in Islam, when you give a thousand ringgit, then you have to give back thousand ringgit. So in the Islamic bank, they charge more. So is it permitted? That is the main question. In Islam, riba is prohibited. There are no less than seven places in the Quran. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 270 and 279, that if you give up not your demands of riba, of interest, take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. That means if you deal in riba, in interest, Allah and His Rasul will wage a war against you. According to Imam al-Dahabi, it is the twelfth major sin in Islam. It's totally prohibited. Regarding a question, that do I agree that Islamic banking is totally Islamic? See, what you have to realize that the commercial banking is more well controlled throughout the world, though it is haram. The Islamic banking is less. So to ask that, is it 100% Islamic? There may be drawbacks. But taking from an Islamic bank is better than taking from a commercial bank. And if you have on the board on the Sharia board of the Islamic bank scholars, which are well renowned, you can be safe. The minor mistake the bank makes, Allah will forgive you. But regarding your question, when you give thousand ringgit, then why do the Islamic bank charge maybe 1,010 or 1,020 or 1,030? They are giving the service charge. Service charge means they are not taking uh, any riba, any interest, but if they have staff, and who will pay for the salary of the staff? So as long as they are following the criteria of the Sharia, 
it's a full system the islamic economic system is there it is quite well researched as long as you are following the sharia principle mentioned in the quran and hadith and you don't break them it is permitted when they charge you it is the service charge because they have offices they have to pay rent they have got staff they have to run the operation so but natural but in the conventional system interest is money earned for the money lent in normal interest it is linked with time it is fixed okay you have to pay 5% interest so every 100 ringgit you take loan in one year you have to give 5 ringgit if you delay by one more year you have to pay 10 in islamic banking they put service charge it may be exactly 5 no problem it can be 4 it can be 6 but if you delay there is no by law you cannot charge more but now to prevent people if you don't have to charge more then people will not pay for 100 years what are you going to do so the sharia board came up with a ruling that you can put a penalty but when you put that penalty you cannot utilize that money you can only take that money which you spent in recovering the money for example you send one man he made phone call you spend x amount of money that x you can take the balance penalty you have to give in charity we don't have time to discuss more details but as long as you follow the sharia the islamic banking best is not to take from any bank number one but if you have to take from a bank take from islamic bank it will not be considered haram as long as unless there is solid proof for you that this bank is actually in the name of islam fleecing you there are some banks i don't want to name them then it is haram but as long as you know that on the sharia board you have good islamic scholars no problem go ahead inshallah you will not be held responsible but today alhamdulillah malaysia is the second country in the world which has islamic banking after saudi arabia in the volume of the world that is there saudi arabia has approximately somewhere close to 34% of the islamic banking malaysia has about 17% mashallah it is number 2 in the world alhamdulillah so malaysia is, is also very well regulated and you have options alhamdulillah so if you want best is not to take loan if you have to take you have no other option take from islamic bank it is halal alhamdulillah don't take from a conventional bank it is the 12th major sin islam hope that answers the question brother thank you let's have uh, from this section please assalam alaikum my brother uh, i always wa- i always was on uh, tvs and i take you i download your youtube videos and i went to papua new guinea and i uh, put on a project and i my Travis Mens with Papua New Guinea, they watch about you and they really like it. Alhamdulillah, my brother. Okay, the question is please. Uh, my question is, I am from the uh, Christian background. Mm-hmm. My name is Muhammad. Uh, people don't, they don't call me Muhammad Papur. Um, my family is now, they are 720s, they are Christians. And I'm the only one Muslims in eight, uh, eight million populations in Papua New Guinea. And we have uh, only 5,000 new Muslims in Papua New Guinea. So my question is, uh, this I just come back from uh, Papua New Guinea and uh, when I was fasting and people keep asking me what is Ramadan and I was like I said the Ramadan is like 40 days 40 nights Jesus was fasting and uh, Moses was fasting in 40 days 40 nights and is there the same r- r- fasting month or the different from the Christianity and uh, Islamic perspectives Thank you The brother's question basically was what is the difference between fasting in Islam and the other is in the christianity fasting is also prescribed in the as the quran says fasting has been prescribed to you as it was prescribed to people who came before you so even the people who came before before prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam allah had prescribed fasting for them but the rules of fasting differed in fasting in the other religions for example in christianity depending upon which sect you belong to there are very different sects you know in some sect okay you don't have to have non veg that's it don't have non veg or vegetable that is fasting some believe in having boiled food it differs it is not as strict as in islam and if you know the history of fasting in islam initially when fasting was prescribed in islam it was somewhere close to little less than 24 hours in fasting in islam initially was the moment the night starts after maghrib you can eat once you sleep you cannot eat till the next maghrib you know so it was close to little less than 24 hours 
the Maghrib you eat, and then once you sleep, so that was fasting, and then there was also the Quran was evil, which I quoted Surah Bakara chapter 2, verse 2183. It became okay. You have to fast from dawn, just before before the Fajr Azan, up to uh, up to Maghrib time. This is the history of fasting. Compared to other religions, like in Hinduism, it is different. In Jainism, their fasting is not to eat, you can drink water. And there it's for a longer period. Some fast for one day, some for a few days, some for 40 days. So in different religions, there are different fasting. But the fasting in Islam is scientifically the best. As I told you in my lecture, that if you abstain from food for close to 12 hours, plus minus few hours, so most of the fasting you see in the world, majority of the countries, you have close to 12 hours. Few hours more, few hours less. And this is the best. Your carbohydrate reserves are used as energy and medically also it's the best and I gave you the medical benefits of that. Hope that answers the question. All right, last one question. Last, last one. Uh, uh, is can, please one question. Can, can, can we have this later? Because we, we must give some other people the chance. I would like to give it to a sister because our time is just so limited. We are about to reach seven o'clock where we will stop questions and answers. Can we have one sister, please? Can we have one sister? I see one sister there. Can we have that sister? Right. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Zakir. Uh, I'm a tour most tourist guide. Blue moss of Shalam is very uh, popular among tourists from Japan. This moss attracts 35,000 tourists uh, from all over the world annually, where 80% tourists. So what's to dawah to these foreigners? Can you repeat the last sentence, please? Can? Uh, okay. This mosque attracts 35,000 tourists from all over the world annually, where 80% are Japanese tourists. Okay. So what's your advice as to how to do da'wah to these foreigners? Thank you. Thank you. Sister, I have a question. That in Shah Alam, the beautiful blue mosque, and even I've been there, attracts about 35,000 tourists from all over the world, especially Japanese. So how can you do da'wah? When the tourists come to an Islamic place, this is the best opportunity for da'wah. Because the tourist is coming on his or her own. So that time they are more, I mean the mind is more open, otherwise normally most of the people's minds are closed. So when a tourist comes to a mosque, it's a very good opportunity for doing dawah. And I'm aware that I go to Putra Mosque, and in Putra Mosque, in Putra Jaya, every day on average 2,000 non-Muslims. 2,000 tourists, out of which majority are non-Muslim. They 80% are Chinese, means in a month about uh, 60,000. In a year, you have more than 700,000 in Putraja, Putra Mosque. We do not have to waste this opportunity. When they come to the mosque, you take it an opportunity to dawa as and when possible. You cannot have a fixed, state jacketed way of doing dawa. If the person who is a guide is a dai who is well versed, it is much better. Because if you answer his question, he's listening to it more. They say, okay, keep quiet, now I will give you a guide. Shut your mouth, okay, blah, 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 blah. That's not effective. So if you have a guide who says, okay, sister, what's your question? So when the sister asks the question or the gent asks the question, and then you do dawah, it is effective. And you have to try and compare. Like you say, if you, if you, if you are even a Christian, if you read in the... In the Bible, in the Old Testament, the Jews were asked to pray three times a day. The, if you, the Christians were asked to pray unseasonally as many times as possible. We Muslims five times. Then you can explain the Adhan. If the Adhan is going on, what is the meaning of you know, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, come to prayer, come to prayer. So if you explain as and when as is required, it will be excellent. What we do normally, oh, this is a mosque. Oh, this is the best carpet in the world. It is the biggest carpet in the world. It costs so many thousand dollars and this was made in so and so years. Yeah, what, what difference does it make whether you spend 10 million dollars or 2 million dollars? That will not help. If you make that non-Muslim pray to Raka Sunnah, you will give him the wealth of the world. What is the mosque? So normally most of the guides, they tell you when it was made, how it was made. Yes, little bit you can say, no problem. But don't spend 90% of your time in that. According to me, you can spend less than 10% on the time, 10% of the time on the history of the mosque. Yes, what you can do, you know, how was the salah started? 
So when you're talking about salah, you give information that we are, Allah says that you have to put the highest part of the body on the lowest part of the ground. Why? Because psychology will tell that if you can control your mind, then you can control your body. So, sorry. <laughs> if you can control your body, then you can control your mind. Your mind is not under your control. If you want to raise your hand, you can raise your hand. You want to step forward, but your mind keeps on wandering. So that is the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in salah asked us to put the highest part of the body, the forehead, on the lowest part on the ground and the subhanahu bin Allah, subhanahu bin Allah. Glory be to Allah the most high. So the full salah, if you see my lecture on salah, the program to righteousness, it's a one and a half hour lecture talking about the position of salah, talking about the scientific benefits, talking about the various things. Now that itself you cannot finish in the tour. But if you have that knowledge, depending upon the question the tourist asks. So the tourist guy, it should be well versed, he should be a professional guy. But what do we do when I go to this mosque? They don't, they give only pocket money. Convince money to the guy. They are keeping security, they are paying so much money. They are having such good facility. What a good mosque, mashallah. To die, they are giving only coming and going money. Why? I feel the highest paid should be the die. Because that will get benefit to the tourist. So if you have an organization here, sister, and go and talk to the government, you can go and talk to the legal authority, that why don't you have, special, have professional duats? Professional dai who are well versed with the comparative religion. When you meet a Hindu, you talk about the Hindu scripture similarities. What does Hinduism say about salah, about prayers? You can talk about dan namaskar, how they do, what does the hadith say? So I feel a tourist coming to the mosque is one of the good opportunity where you can convey message. But while conveying message, see to it that you also talk about tawheed. Most important message in dawah is tawheed. Most of the people think that when they come into the mosque, they want to look where is the idol of Allah, Nauz Billah. But when you go to the temple, you look where is the idol of that God. When you go to the church, you look for the, where is the idol of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. So first they look at, to tell them, yeah, there is no image of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah has got no, no idol. Allah has got no image. So that's how when you convey the message, talk about Tawhi, talk about, talk about beloved Prophet Muhammad talk about Salah, Inshallah you will win their heart. Even if you cannot convert them, at least you can remove the animosity from their mind. So I have given talks on similarity between Islam and Christianity, similarity between Islam and Hinduism, and these lectures don't hurt. It will not insult. Who will it insult? Those who are fanatic Muslims. Ah. By hearing Dr. Zakir Naik's lecture, many people are accepting Islam. So they say Zakir is spreading hatred. I said, get me one sentence in my speech which is spreading hatred. They cannot. Our Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, just a week back, in his election rally, he took my name nine times in two minutes. In one minute, 59 seconds exactly. He took my name nine times. Can you believe the President, I'm the Prime Minister of India, his psychology is that he wants to scare the Muslims and tell the Hindus that I know this Rakin Naik terrorist. Imagine using my name nine times to win the World Bank in two minutes. Alhamdulillah, Allah has raised me to this level, mashallah. Amount of duas I'm getting from the people. So you have to be effective. And believe me, I've got so many non-Muslim friends. Majority of the non-Muslim love me in India. It's only after Narendra Modi started his campaign and spent, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars against, you know, against me to propagate for his vote bank. Now maybe those who don't know me may be cursing me, but the majority who know me, they love me. They respect me. When I go through the custom, they say, oh, this man, whatever he says, speak the truth, he will never lie. You know, that's the oath you take on the, in the court of law. So the thing is there that we should convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ta'alu ila kalimatin sawa im bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse 125, Allah says, Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah, wal mu'adhat al hasna, wajadun bilati hasan. Invite all the way of thy Lord with the wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Hope that answers the question.
All right, unfortunately, the time is so limited. We're just about one or two minutes away from seven o'clock. So please keep your uh, questions to yourself first. Inshallah, there will be more rallies. I heard uh, from the organizer that we'll be having some kind of rally, inshallah, inshallah, or somewhere around. So keep your dates open, and we will have Dr. Zakir to answer all your questions, inshallah. Dates open. Yeah? Dates. Dates. They're all dates. <laughs> all right. Right now, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, with the last question answered, I'm sorry, that wraps up our Q&A session. Uh, to the audience who have participated in the session, we thank you so much for your contribution. And of course, our heartfelt appreciation to Dr. Zakir for the spot on responses. Now, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is greatly hoped that today's date in Ramadan with Dr. Zakir has been a very enlightening and fulfilling one for everyone. As a token of appreciation for gracing us his kind presence and uh, sharing his knowledge and thoughts, we wish to cordially invite uh, Chegu Azmi right, to present to our celebrated speaker, Dr. Zakir Naik, with a souvenir and a note or memorandum of appreciation. Tafadali Sheikh.